This is a podcast from the Fitzwilliam Museum, Cambridge. My name is John Van Wy. I'm a Darwin historian in Cambridge, and we're sitting in the rooms of Christ College, where Darwin was a student between 1828 and 1831. Well, it's very frequently said that Darwin studied theology or divinity at Cambridge, but that's actually quite wrong. Darwin came up to Cambridge and enrolled for an ordinary BA or Bachelor of Arts degree, and that was a prerequisite in order to study to become a member of the Church of England. But Darwin never undertook any of that divinity training after getting his BA. So he came to Cambridge, he studied for his BA, he earned a BA, but then the Voyage of the Beagle came up. So he went on the Voyage of the Beagle and never studied to become a clergyman. But he did spend three very formative years in Cambridge where he really blossomed into becoming a naturalist. And during most of the time, he lived in this room, which has recently been restored to look as close as possible to its look in Darwin's day. A few years ago, when the Darwin Committee was formed at Christ's, I, as the Darwin historian on the committee, proposed that we should restore Darwin's rooms to look like they did in his own day and open them to the public again. They haven't been open to the public for exactly 100 years. In 1909, when we celebrated the Darwin centenary in Cambridge, the rooms were briefly open to the public, but they weren't restored then. They were just open so people could see this is where Charles Darwin lived. But this time around, we've done a great deal of work, and many experts have helped us to make the room look as realistic as it does, particularly the the conservators who, who came in and found traces of paint. These rooms were just brown wood paneling, brown oak. But originally in Darwin's day, they would have been painted. And the conservators found microscopic traces of paints, which allowed them to reconstruct the history of layers of different colors in the rooms. And this color, this sort of soft, earthy green, this is the actual color that this room was in Darwin's day. So that combined with the specially made period carpet we've had made for the rooms, which uses some of the same colors, and the seat cushion cover that was found in the bay window, which is apparently right for Darwin's time. It could be the actual seat cushion that was here in Darwin's day. We've used that to reconstruct the fabric with which the curtains are made, and they've been handmade by an expert from period designs to, as faithfully as possible, reconstruct what this room really looked and felt like in Darwin's day. An average day in Christ for Darwin would begin around 7 a.m. when his college servant would come and wake him up in time for chapel. The chapel is just across the court. So he would trundle over to chapel for half an hour, in which it's very likely that Darwin, with all the other students, would have rotated through Bible readings at the head of the chapel. After that, he would come back to his room where his bed had been made by the bedmaker, and the servant would lay breakfast out on the table before the fire where we're sitting now. After that, there were two hours of college lectures, basically maths and classics. So you had to know Greek to a very high level. Uh, And Darwin, of course, had been studying Greek at school since he was a child. After those hours of lectures, there was free time. Darwin spent most of his free time collecting beetles and hunting. He loved shooting birds. And he had a a hunting dog and a double-barreled shotgun in his room. Not the sort of thing that uh, undergraduates are allowed to have today, but it was a very different world in, in Darwin's day. And the feeling of the room also shows you this, that this was a very elegant, well-to-do space of a a very well-to-do young man. At four o'clock, they had dinner in the college hall, and that was the required meal of the day. Darwin sat with the undergraduates in the hall, and, and the meal consisted merely of a joint of meat and a glass of beer. If they wanted anything extra, they had to pay for it. Uh, So there's actually a column in the college bills beside the meal account for vegetables. So we can see from that that Darwin had his vegetables. After that, uh, they could either visit with friends, go for walks in the countryside, and that sort of thing. The curriculum was very loose. There wasn't a lot of requirements. They had lots of free time. Many young men spent that time gambling, going to the horse races, drinking, playing cards. Darwin did some of the drinking, the playing cards, but he spent most of his time pursuing his hobbies and interests in science, particularly beetles and entomology. He began to collect things at a very high level, and he acquired a collection that was extremely impressive. And soon his captures were in print. So for the first time, Darwin's words appeared in print while he was a student at Christ's. In later years, Darwin remembered in his autobiography his time in Christ's. And when he couldn't go out shooting birds, he liked to practice with his shotgun. And one of the things he would do was throw it up to his shoulder in front of a mirror. So from that, we know that he had a mirror in here. But he said a much better plan was to have a friend move a lighted candle around. And Darwin would put a percussion cap 
on the nipple of the shotgun without actually loading it with powder and shot. And when he fired, if the aim was accurate, the puff of air would blow out the candle. And this seems to have been a really great hobby of Darwin's. He did it for hours and hours. So much so that Darwin heard through the grapevine that the tutor of the college said, what an extraordinary thing it is that Mr. Darwin seems to spend hours cracking a horsewhip in his rooms. Darwin's interests while he was at Christ were in some ways more varied than they were later in his life. He had very passionate interests in music and also in fine art. So while he was here, he was inspired to study paintings and fine engravings at the Fitzwilliam Museum. And on a shop on Fitzwilliam Street, we know that he bought various prints. And some of these prints, we think we know exactly which ones he had. And three of them have been put back in the room here. Uh, Two of them are copies from the Fitzwilliam Museum's own collection. So they're the kinds of prints that we know Darwin appreciated when he was at Christ, and he displayed them with some pride. It's interesting to note that many years later, Darwin's eldest son came to Christ in 1858, and he lived in the same rooms, and he brought some of his father's original prints back into these rooms. Darwin was clearly very interested in the visual arts when he was a student. So, of course, he's looking at these engravings and really knew how to appreciate the style and the skill that went into creating them. But, of course, he's also looking at natural history illustrations at the same time. So we have in the room here copies of Stephen's British Entomology with beautiful engravings, hand-colored engravings of beetles and other insects, which Darwin would have also poured over hour after hour, comparing these to the things he collected. And we know that he appreciated the visual beauty of some of the beetles that he collected. He thought they were beautiful objects, beautiful creations. So he must have had a high visual delight as he pinned his individual beetles into his collecting cabinet. Darwin seems to be more prone to myths than most figures. You could accurately say that most of what most people have heard about Charles Darwin is wrong. He didn't study theology at Christ's. He didn't sail on the Beagle just to go to the Galapagos. He didn't discover evolution in the Galapagos. He didn't come back and then keep his theory a secret for 20 years. He doesn't seem to have given up Christianity when his daughter died. He wasn't an atheist. He wasn't out to upset the Bible or religion. So, you know, there's so many things that have frequently repeated about Darwin are wrong. And I think the true story is much more interesting and much more nuanced. Charles Darwin was a well-to-do, enthusiastic, likable young man who was absolutely devoted to studying nature and to studying natural puzzles. And that began from his earliest days, his earliest childhood. It's very often said that Darwin was an atheist, but there's no evidence that Darwin was ever an atheist. He started life as a perfectly average member of the Church of England. He wasn't particularly religious. He wasn't uh, biblically minded. He did intend to become a clergyman, but basically that meant that he wouldn't have to work very much and could spend most of his time on his natural history hobbies. But of course, he never became a clergyman. He never studied for holy orders. But he he did, after the voyage of the Beagle, decide that uh, he didn't believe in Christianity. And he talked about this in some length in his autobiography. And he described it as a process in which he He began to doubt, he began looking for evidence that would be sufficient to back up the extraordinary claims and miracles by which Christianity is supported. But he found that with time, he didn't feel that it was supported by the evidence. And so he described the process of losing his faith as a very gradual process in which there was absolutely no distress. And by the end, he'd completely given up that faith and never doubted that for a single second. But that's his faith in Christianity. That's not to say that he gave up his belief that there was a creator, that there was a God. And Darwin always retained some lingering belief or suspicion that something, some intelligence, had started everything off in the beginning. But science showed that the way nature works is regular. There are natural laws that can be discovered to explain why things happen the way they do. That nowhere was there any evidence for any break in the natural laws, no no miracles could have occurred. This, there was no evidence for this. So Darwin believed very passionately that something may have started off nature in the first place, but now only natural laws control how nature works. And a, a scientist like himself, through hard work, could figure out what these laws of nature really were. Another thing that people very often hear about Darwin is that when The Origin of Species was published, there was a huge outcry, a huge clash of science versus religion. But this doesn't really seem to have been the case. In fact, most people either saw what Darwin was saying as a new step in science that wasn't really that far beyond what 
had already been accepted. People already knew that the world was more than 6,000 years old. Everyone already accepted that there was a series of previous eras of life preserved in the fossil record one after another. Uh, we, everyone knew that this had happened. What Darwin showed was a, way, a new way of explaining this, that there was a natural process that linked all of this together, that connected the dots. But other people thought that Darwin was saying that God works via this mechanism, i.e. evolution by natural selection is how God makes n- new species come about. So for people of, of that ilk, there was no problem with accepting Darwin. They could carry on with their religious beliefs and accept Darwin. Others felt that it was a step too far, that Darwin was divorcing God so entirely from the actions of nature that they couldn't accept that. So there were many different reactions. But uh, within about 15 or 20 years, the row was basically over. Darwin was accepted as, as right by the international scientific community ar- around the world. And that's something that most people have forgotten because it's still represented today in the, in the popular media as controversial. Well, it, it was controversial between 1859 and 1869 or thereabouts. But since then, basically, it's been over. Scientifically speaking, no one doubts evolution anymore.